So we started thinking from a technical point of view, how this was possible. How, how could we possibly be doing this? How are we moving funds without making any transactions, right? And that was basically how we eventually ended up on, hey, wait, we can use the blockchain in a different way. We can start thinking about money in a completely different way. We can start moving assets on the blockchain with you know the blockchain security and finality, but without making transactions. And that was how it dawned on us that using a similar pattern, we could basically implement uh, perpetual money streams, which is uh, what Superfluid is about. So we got extremely excited. Welcome to Mission DeFi with Brad Nickel, where we explore projects in decentralized finance that are innovating and driving our mission of financial freedom forward. Thank you for listening. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, rate, and review Mission DeFi and spread the word by posting a tweet to the show. All opinions expressed by Brad Nickel or his guests are their opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Black Knox, Material Indicators, or any other affiliated organizations. You should not treat any opinion expressed by Brad Nickel or his guests as an inducement to make a particular investment, follow a particular strategy, or become involved with any project. A project being featured on the show is not an endorsement of that project in any way. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Now, here's Mission DeFi with Brad Nickel. I'm excited today to have Francesco Renzi joining the show from Superfluid. And I'm excited for a couple of things. I think there's some really obvious problems that this project solves for crypto, ones that are actually very personal and near and dear to my company, trying to handle subscription payments. But more importantly, I think there are a ton of potential uh, use cases for Superfluid. And so I'm really excited to have Fran on to join us and talk about what they've built, what they're building. So Fran, thanks so much for joining us. If you could introduce yourself, kind of let people know your background and how you ended up in this business and then how Superfluid kind of originated and got started. Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Brad, for inviting me. So my name is Francesco. I'm uh, one of those people that has done uh, all sorts of different things before turning into crypto. So I've always had a passion for entrepreneurship, for tech. You know, I've always been kind of looking at uh, tech trends very, very keenly, but I, don't, I have no technical background, right? So I didn't have a, a job in tech or anything of the sorts. So I came to crypto in a very extremely roundabout way. But at some point in 2017, I ended up in a meetup. And this meetup was basically somebody was trying to sell me an ICO. It was a very fun time. I don't know. For, well, for everybody who was around in, in autumn 2017, I'm sure you all, you'll remember what was happening about that time. So I immediately was completely sucked into this. Like I, I couldn't get enough of it. I dropped everything I was doing. I, I dropped all my clients from my previous job and just immediately started you know, watching videos, reading stuff. At that point, I also started teaching myself to code just to have a, a deeper understanding of what was going on and how I could, you know, use this completely new part of tech that I'd never heard of. And that was, uh, you know, seemingly going to change the world in the next two months. And then obviously the bear market start, started. So that kind of changed the the, the time scale. It didn't change my conviction. It definitely stayed in, uh, in crypto, never wavered on that, but it changed the time scale, right? So it was clear that it wasn't going to happen in the next three months because three months had passed, but it was definitely going to happen. So taught, as I said, taught myself to code, kept working on that. I found myself an amazing person to work with who is currently our CTO. And together we started building uh, products in the crypto space. So mostly, most of them didn't see the light of day, but uh, a couple of them did. At some point in 2019, we built a product called Ardai. So Ardai was this, uh, init- it was one of the first derivatives built on top of Dai. At the time, you know, th- there wasn't much of 
what we now call DeFi. You know, we had Compound, we had uh, Uniswap, MakerDAO, but that's about it, right? So RDI was one of the first composable money Legos. If you if you search Google for money Legos, you'll find the RDI logo around. And awesome. basically, what it did was just kind of split interest from principal in Compound, right? So okay. this was kind of the idea we 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 built. So we went to this amazing hackathon, 2019. There were a lot, still a lot of those, which was uh, ETH Berlin. And in East Berlin, we met our third co-founder. So we started thinking a lot about uh, what we were doing, right? And effectively, we f we figured that the the most interesting thing we were doing with Ardai was uh, programmable interest streaming, right? So we would basically send interest from one account to another without uh, paying any gas. So we started thinking from a technical point of view, how this was possible. How, how could we possibly be doing this? How are we moving funds without making any transactions, right? And that was basically how we eventually ended up on, hey, wait, we can use the blockchain in a different way. We can start thinking about money in a completely different way. We can start moving assets on the blockchain with you know the blockchain security and finality, but without making transactions. And that was how it dawned on us that using a similar pattern, we could basically implement uh, perpetual money streams, which is oh. uh, what Superfluid is about. So we got extremely excited. That was uh, 2019, you know, took a while for us to drop everything, finish our die because we just started it, right? So we wanted to finish <laughs> it first and then eventually, you know, create a startup and, and start working on, you know, getting this protocol out there and basically you know, doing what we've what we've done so far, which is basically build build out the protocol and put it into people's hands to see what they come up with. Wow. Okay. So, first question I just have to ask is: Are die still functioning out there? Are people still utilizing it in any way, or is it just kind hey, of like the... it's immutable on the blockchain, right? Sure, so... of course. But I mean, is anybody uh, actually using it, or did you guys just kind of? Like I think go... uh, people are still using it because it's very simple. You can basically right. uh, you put money in and you say who you want to get the interest, and it's a very simple way to make no loss donations. So nice. some people are still using it for donations. Oh, um, that's awesome. Which is, which is an interesting, uh, you know, use case. To us, it, it it was interesting, but it wasn't big enough, right? We wanted sure. to, when we found Superfluid, we just said, this is this is just something we have to work on, right? So yeah. so Ardai just kind of uh, fell fell a bit in the, in the back there. But I think there's now a lot of other protocols that do similar things. So it's not so important for us to, to work on it. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, there are other things that can do it. So are you, I mean, in 2017, you'd never coded before you had no tech background. Suddenly you're teaching yourself to code, which, you know, there's a lot of folks out there right now that would figure, like to figure out how to do that, at least in uh, solidity. Are you actively coding this project or is that not your role on the project? No, it's, it's absolutely not my role in the project. Okay. Uh, okay. Actually, we, you know, we dedicate a lot of time to developer experience and building things for developers. And I'm actually used internally as the, the, the That's tester, brilliant. right? So if, if Frank can run it, then it's, it's, you know, it's I for everyone. I love it. And it's simple <laughs> enough. That's brilliant. Exactly. That's great. Exactly. Well, but, and understanding uh, how code works is a critical exactly. factor exactly. in working with devs anyway, right? Um, and exactly. building tech products. I'm, that's. I have never been someone that finally took the time to learn to code in the 26 years. I've always said I want to learn how to code, <laughs> but I have studied enough coding to understand how it functions. So when a, when a developer tells me something couldn't be done in my past, I'm able to actually climb into and find where it can be done. So exactly. I think that's a really valuable skill. And I love the fact that you're kind of the, the guinea pig for <laughs> make it simple enough so Fran can do it. That's great. Exactly. Exactly. That's and awesome. And I'll say I have uh, done some solidity. I've done some front end. It's, you know, none of it is impossible to learn, right? And right. I would, you know, tell everybody who's who thinks they should uh, learn to code to, you know, get out there, write something, because it, it really isn't that hard. And even if it doesn't end up being your profession, like in my case, it's still very important because you, in my opinion, I would have never come up with uh, Superfluid if I hadn't had a rather deep understanding of how this stuff works, right? Right. And and that's I think the key in under the key in, in developing anything which is meaningfully different is to meaningfully understand how the current stuff is built. Right. Yep. No, it makes total sense. I ran, I launched and ran with some partners coding summer camps here in the South Florida area for three years. Um 
I don't recommend running summer camps, but <laughs> it, it, it was a lot of fun because they were coding oriented. And, and the reason I ran them was I felt like kids never didn't have to become expert coders or actually choose it as a profession, but if they didn't understand how it functioned, then, then in the, in the real world that they are going to face in the very near future, it's going to put them at a severe disadvantage, right? In whatever job they actually are doing in the world or, or profession. So for me, that was the mo the driving motivation behind it was to make sure my kids actually understood coding and neither of them are full-time coders, but my son uses it all the time as needed. Right. So anyway, I think that's great. That's a great story. Okay. So let's get into, you know, the comment that you made of, we figured out with our die that we could move funds without transactions, but still having the security of a blockchain. So can you explain to us how that's done? Yeah, absolutely. So, well, first of all, what, what the result of that, of that discovery was is Superfluid is an asset streaming protocol that's uh, meant to bring subscriptions, salaries, and rewards to DAOs and crypto native businesses. So what we're building is a protocol that allows you to create what we call super tokens. Super tokens are an extension of existing token standards. So it extends both ERC-20 and ERC-777 tokens. And it adds, basically the core innovation is what we call dynamic balances. So generally, if you think of how a token works, right? And this is going back to what I said before that you really have to understand how the stuff is coded. Sure. A, a token is, is literally just uh, a mapping of an address and their balance, right? So we store a number for each user. So that's the amount of tokens they have. What we do with Superfluid is fairly different. So with Superfluid, we store a bunch of different pieces of data, which are then used to calculate a user's balance. So user balances pass from being a stored variable, which doesn't move to a variable which is calculated based on stored data and global variables. And one of that, those global variables is time. So just to give you an idea, Superfluid is built as a, as a token standard. So it has different agreements, which are basically, you can think of them as financial relationships between users. Okay. But the, the one we generally are known for and speak the most of is uh, money streaming. So what money streaming is, is an agreement between user A and user B, where user A says they will transfer X amount of tokens to the counterparty every second. Now, when the user sends the transaction that initiates the stream, this information is stored on the blockchain. Once it's stored on the blockchain, the user's balance will be calculated based on this new information. And using the time, which is part of the blockchain, right? The blockchain, each block is time stamped. Sure. So, so the clock is, is a very, you know, secure part of the blockchain. And by using that timestamp and the data we've stored, we are able to then calculate balances every block. Okay. So when you, when you go and query your balance, it will say, you know, I have a hundred dollars. And then if you query it again, the next block, it will say, I have a hundred dollars plus, you know, $10, right. Depending on how much you're receiving or sending each second. Okay. So does that make sense to you? Yep. So, so far. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so yeah, basically you use the blockchain to calculate and store the information on how much each person has, but that doesn't mean that you have to send a transaction every time that number changes. That number can change over time based on uh, information you've stored on the blockchain earlier. Okay. So you're storing the record of kind of what's owed or what is being theoretically transferred. What is committed in a sense. Committed. Yes. And then at some point when the transaction ends or the predetermined time for that relationship ends, and I'm just guessing here, <laughs> then those funds are transferred on the blockchain at that point. Is that theoretically no. <laughs> Okay, no, so I'm way off. <laughs> no, you're not, you're not. Because I was, is, about, I was is, about to uh, say, I sound like I'm talking about the Lightning Network. So I wanted to make sure. Exactly, that, no, yeah. exactly. And it, it's actually uh, interestingly different. So okay. the Lightning Network is a layer two, right? You, right. you uh, do stuff off chain and then you go back to the chain and you settle. Right. Uh, Superfluid is completely on the blockchain. There's okay. nothing happening off chain. And when you open a stream, 
the funds are settled effectively at every block. So if I say I will send you a uh, dollar per second, the next block you will have as many dollars as seconds have passed. Okay. That's that's it. So the okay. funds are settled immediately. There's no there's no kind of settlement at a later point. Got which it. is uh, confusing to understand because we're used to settlement being this big thing that has to be made to happen by a transaction, right? What's right. actually happening in Superfluid is that settlement is is built into the protocol. The protocol settles everybody's streams at every block. So, and this is, it's, it's kind of interesting if you look at it from a um, uh, kind of broader point of view. One thing you can do with Superfluid, which is, as far as I know, not done by anyone else, is that you can effectively net transactions. Mm -hmm. So imagine you're sending me, you know, a thousand dollars per month, right? For, for some consulting I'm doing. And I'm then um, spending some of that money to pay for my rent, right? The funds that I receive go straight to the person I'm paying. They don't even go through me because the incoming and outgoing flows are, are netted in real time. So we don't have to wait for the funds to arrive to my account and then I can send them. They're going at the same time every second. Okay, so the funds <laughs> are transferred. Let me let me just make sure I grasp this. I'm not <laughs> no sure worries. I do. So the funds the funds are my relationship. You're I'm you're paying me a thousand bucks a month for consulting. Okay, and we have a what what do you call the relationship between uh, stream. us? A stream. Just a stream. Yeah. So we have a stream between us. We've agreed to this. I'm assuming we sign in our wallet a contract yep. that says I will do this, and then that thousand dollars start streaming out based on an amount per second that's calculated exactly over that month however many seconds there are in a month and and in real time those transactions are happening per second and get settled on each block and so the funds have been transferred to you incrementally up to the end of the 30-day period and you've already started to receive those funds but what you're saying is is that you could have a relationship a, a stream with your landlord and yep. so because that stream obligates you to also pay X amount per second, that rather than those funds going to you first, they stream directly to the landlord because it knows that you're owed those funds. It, it Theoretically, it does go through your account. But okay. if you if you look at how the balance is changing, your balance could stop moving. So if okay. I'm sending you $1,000 and you're sending $1,000 to someone else, your balance does it move because right. it, uh, those, it's not uh, changing because it's going right out. Exactly. So those okay. transactions net to zero and then okay. the funds just move to their counterparty. And this, like, it's very theoretical, but if I put it into practice for you, what it means is if uh, you as a consultant, as a consultant have some bills that you're expecting to be paid at the 30th, but you have to pay your salaries for your employees on the 25th, Right. Currently, you you have a liquidity gap, and you have to fix that. Right. You right. you have to maybe take a loan to pay those salaries before your bills get paid. Now, if everything is happening in real time at the same time, so uh, if your your customers are paying you while you pay your employees, all those funds are streamed in real time, and your gap becomes way smaller. Oh, that's, that's brilliant. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, and that's absolutely. super important. That's why we say Superfluid is very capital efficient because wow. it allows you to run a very, a very capital efficient business, which is something, you know, people don't generally think about, but is actually a huge problem. Like I think it's in the US alone, I saw this uh, figure recently where you have $1.2 uh, trillion in overdraft fees and overdraft fees are effectively this, right? Why does the bank charge you an overdraft? They charge you an overdraft because your salary is getting to you later. You know, you, you get paid after you your bills are due, right? right. So if, if we can remove that, we can save a lot of people a lot of money. And that's, that's something phenomenal. very exciting. Wow. Okay, so do you find that people have problems conceptually coping with this? <laughs> yes. Even though it's an advantage for them? Because Absolutely. I can see that. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's moving from this transactions to kind of bandwidth based money, right? Or flow rate based money. It's 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 a very it's a very outwardly concept. What I'll say is most people eventually understand that streams are kind of uh, like 
this sounds crazy, but the way I see it, streams are how money should work, right? Because right. if you think about it, our relationships with businesses are not once a month. Like if um, if I subscribe to to your service, right, I'm not using it once a month. I'm using it continuously. And I just happen to pay you once a month because we're used to banks being inefficient, right? right. But a relationship is continuous. So the payment should also be continuous. So on a kind of a psychological level, it's natural. From an accounting perspective, it's definitely a big shift and people will need some time to adjust. But you know, we're building tools to make that slightly easier, hopefully. Yeah, I, I mean, I think effectively, oh, there's so much here, dude. This is Because <laughs> I, I, I hadn't conceptually gone this far with, with my research of you guys. And now now that I get that, it, it makes a huge difference. I mean, I immediately think of eliminating, I mean, obviously you've, You've got to build a massive group of users. But on the business side, I was thinking about the entire, in the United States, capital advance market, right? So this is the idea of borrowing against future income on your credit card transactions or your potential bank deposits, which is usually would be the rates that they charge would be illegal for consumers, but for businesses, it is not. And it runs essentially businesses out of business because they're charging ridiculous rates. They're taking a cut of income every month and businesses can't ever dig out of it. But the people who are giving the advances have already been paid and made a fortune already, you know, in the first few months. Well, this kind of, this kind of thing eliminates probably 90% of the short term, if massively and scaly yeah, and, and adopted, it, it eliminates 90% of the short term debt problem. For, exactly. And I'm just throwing out a made up number there, but it really feels uh, like that's obviously the case. Yeah, I, I would I wouldn't go so far as saying it eliminates that because that is is useful, right? People take that because it's useful to them. I think what it does is it makes that cheaper. It makes the amounts people need to borrow much cheaper, and conversely, it will make that more accessible, right? So, right. Uh, the, it, I w I wouldn't say it eliminates that because that is useful. I hope it doesn't eliminate that, but I hope it makes that more accessible, useful, and hopefully. You know, people will need to borrow less, and the fees well, they'll have need to, to borrow, borrow less, and, pe and people will not be able to charge as much, right? So Absolutely. When when I know that the if if I'm the capital advance company, and I know that the potential market I'm going after has shrunk dramatically, and the amounts to be funded have shrunk dramatically, and now businesses are actually using it for marketing or to buy equipment or whatever, then first of all, my investments in them are are much more stable. I'm not only having people that are desperate coming to me and I can't get away with charging as much because the competitiveness of the market has increased and the amount of people that need it and that are desperate for it has decreased. It's really fascinating. Yeah. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunities when you bring, basically when you bring cash flows on chain, right? If you think right. of it, the, the idea of a cash flow is this kind of, this connected transactions, right? So I pay you every month and then you look at your, your bank statement and you say, oh, I have a cash flow from Francesco, right? But actually those are disconnected transactions, which are hard to think about in a computer science way. But if you look at Superfluid, it's a completely different paradigm because a flow is literally either on or off, right? So you're either getting paid every second or you're not getting paid every second. What this means from a, from a developer's point of view is you can now build applications that consider cash flows as just another piece of data, right? So right. you have your balance, uh, you have your balance as an app, you know, DeFi applications, generally they just deal with balances, right? So my application has a balance of a uh, hundred die, right? Well, when you build on Superfluid, so we call them super apps, your your application has a balance of a hundred die and a flow rate of 0 0.001, uh, die per second, right? Okay. And you can manipulate that. You can uh, build applications that send streams. You can receive incoming streams. You can uh, build uh, debt markets. You can build NFTs that carry that cash flow and represent the debts and the future income. There's all sorts of stuff you can build. And basically, it's just this massive new primitive that allows you to build with money that is not there yet, but will provably and security be there at the next block. And it's kind of a, a mind shift, but you know, as a builder, it's super exciting. And sure. when, like, I didn't know any solidity until we, we basically released the framework. And then I'm like, okay, I have to build something. This is too exciting. That's so I, I taught myself solidity and one of the, actually my first solidity, a smart contract is still uh, in our repo and people use it to build applications. So it's quite, 
You That's know, it's, awesome. It's, it's quite, that was more, I wasn't bragging. It's just to say it's pretty easy to use. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. That makes sense. When I, when I enter into a stream with someone else, are the funds that I have committed to that stream over a longer period of time in some way locked, or is it just an assumption that those will, those will be available. If I happen to pull out those funds, then the stream stops. And then the developers would obviously lock access to whatever I was accessing because of that. Right. Exactly. Exactly. This, the protocol really, so when designing a protocol, I, you know, I, the fact that I read so much in the last four years kind of helped me design this uh, properly. And we designed it with as much creative surface as possible. So the protocol isn't tied to any use case. And that's, okay. in my opinion, that's very important to enable, you know, builders to build and us to build a protocol. And as a result, the protocol makes no assumptions on the user actually having any amount of funds, which is also one of the reasons it scales very well, because you can have a million incoming streams and the the protocol doesn't care if any of those users doesn't have funds. It doesn't need to check. That's completely removed from the protocol. And that enables the protocol to, to scale and users to, to basically use this without too many afterthoughts, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it makes, makes complete sense. And I, I think that that simplification of it obviously makes it able to scale better and, and, and perform yeah. better. Do you envision people, so we've talked about kind of per month, right? But I think also you're, the shifting of people, the, the, the thought processes start to shift, right? You start to think, oh, well, wait a minute, this isn't really per month. If I can do this per second, then maybe there are shorter time frame things I can do with this protocol, right? Like, do you envision people utilizing it for particular things on demand, right? So not like a tipping protocol, but I mean, something where it's like, okay, can they do a short term two hour stream of something they wanna utilize Right. And they engage with that. Does that even make sense with what you guys have built for something like that to make it fluid and fast and easy for people to engage that way? So there's two things I'd say. First is that uh, it's not by month. That's correct. But I would say that by month is, is kind of something we in the crypto space we should forget. Like I remember there's this major discussion with people still showing APY. Right. Right. When realistically there isn't a single farm that's lasted 12 months. Right. So why are you giving me a month? Why are you giving me a yearly rate? Right. So I think similarly. Yeah, exactly. And I think this is going to happen with salaries. Like we're going to stop saying you're, you're paying me a annually annual rate. Right. People working for DAOs often, you know, work for very short periods. They'll jump from one DAO to another. They'll have maybe different kinds of arrangements with different DAOs. I think eventually we'll find a better way of describing how much we pay people. I think per second amounts are very hard to understand, but there might be a, a better way. So I think we'll move away from the monthly. And when you move away from the monthly, then yeah, longer, short term, midterm, they all kind of blend in together. Right. Making two hour streams, in my opinion, doesn't make sense because what the main advantages of streams well, there's there's two things that I'm very kind of excited about with streams. The first is that it removes interactions, which means as a business, I pay my employee, that's one transaction. And then until I fire him, I never do another transaction, right? Removing those transactions, removing those interactions is uh, valuable, right? Because your time making those transactions is, is uh, time that you could spend building something else. Sure. And if you're making if you're making a two hour stream, you have to open the stream, close the stream. That's two transactions. While you could realistically just make a transfer at the end of those two hours, right? right? Because the other big thing that happens with streams is the reduction in trust. So let me explain what this means. If um, if you're providing a service, let's go back to employment because it's something most people uh, can relate to very well, right? So imagine I'm working for my employer and you know I come from a country, I'm, I'm from Italy, and Italy has generally, it's a terrible place to work. It's a terrible place to be an employee. And it's happened to me that my employer wouldn't pay me, right? Wow. But the moment I found out my employer wasn't gonna pay me wasn't when I started working. It wasn't 15 days in. It was 30 days in, right? right? I'd already worked a full month for my employer and then he didn't pay me. Right. So that's basically how our uh, society is structured, right? We generally trust employers. We trust the people we we know to, to do what they say, right? But, you know, the same as it's happened to me, I'm sure it's happened to a lot of people. 
And th there's a simple solution to that now, which is pay me every second I work for you. The moment you stop that stream, I will stop working. The moment I stop working, you can stop that stream, right? So it's a much fairer deal for the person working. And it also means I don't need to know who you are, right? I can now work for a company based in, I don't know, somewhere I don't, I wouldn't trust anyone, but it doesn't matter because they're paying me every second, right? right. I can work, I can work for a, a bunch of dog avatars on Twitter because they're paying me every second. I don't need to know their names anymore, right? And that's generally the beauty of crypto, right? The smart contracts allow us to do this, these kinds of, um, you know, trustless transactions. But now it's also available for things that are longer term and kind of uh, perpetual in a sense. So, you know, being able to reduce the need for trust in the provision of services is something that Superfluid enables very well and I'm very excited about, but is less of a concern on the short time scale. If, okay. I'm, if I'm doing a two hour consulting job, you know, it's just two hours, right? That's all right. I'm, I'm spending on my side. I'm very likely to either get paid or never work with that person again. For some high stakes use cases, it might make sense, but generally I think the longer the scale, actually the more sense uh, Superfluid makes. Yeah, I was thinking along the lines of, let's say in the example of our company, Material Indicators, there are tools that we have that people don't need access to all day long, every day, right? Yeah. They, once a week, once a month, they're going in to check and see if the trends are where they want to, if they want to stay in their portfolio or not. And maybe they'll use it two or three times in a month. I don't know. But so rather than charging those people a monthly fee or per second that I know they're going to, I'm going to take over a course of a month, just enabling a channel bet between us, I'm talking in lightning terms again, but <laughs> you know, having a stream between us that allows them to turn that on and off. But it almost sounds like, you know, I could just have them send me the crypto for it and not, and then they have access for two hours and go on. But I, I was thinking about if you're building a system already utilizing Superfluid where your monthly subscribers are paying you, but you yep. still wanted to turn on a business model that allowed people to use it occasionally, mm -hmm. since I'm already using your platform, it'd be cool to have it both ways anyway. It's it's definitely possible. There's a, a bunch of different people who've uh, built uh, very cool hacks during hackathons where, nice. for example, they would pay for every second of a video. They would pay for every second ah. of a Skype call. Like this kind of stuff immediately captures people in people's imagination. And I think it will be a bigger part of our life going forward, the kind of paper, paper second mentality. But yeah, I, I'm personally more captivating with disrupting uh, trade finance, like you mentioned before, than kind of doing that kind of thing. But one thing I'm quite excited about is people who work with time tracking, for example. Ah, attorneys, uh, et cetera. Yeah, I think, I think there there's, uh, an interesting, there's an interesting use case because it allows you to, in this case, you would trust the tra time tracking software. Right, sure. but by tracking that software, you can then have a much more fluid way of working, where you you still get paid out every second, but you only get paid out when you're working, right? And yeah. I can imagine in the future maybe having you know a DAO with hundreds of people that are being paid only when they clock in hours yeah. would be would be fascinating, right? And for a DAO which has somehow a very bureaucratic way of making payments at the moment, right? Like if you look at some DAOs, they can only make payments if there's a coin, coin vote on chain, right? Right. Like that's a lot of friction of to course. make a simple thing, to make a simple payment, right? So right. being able to enable that in a more seamless way and being able to expand what the future of work looks like is something quite exciting. Well, it's interesting, the legal example, I, I worked for a legal tech firm in early in my career, and there's a couple of things happening here that I think actually makes this even more valuable. The first is attorneys are horrible at collecting on their bills because they're afraid to piss off their clients. So having a stream with every client that is paying you in real time as you're working for those clients is a really brilliant thing. I think that has incredible potential. Then it also eliminates the fact that most clients feel like they're being billed for stuff beyond what they actually got in terms of time. And so I think there's also incredible value there in having that available and an integration with time tracking and other yeah. research tools, et cetera. I mean, that's really I think, incredible. I think in general, paying for every second simply clears up a lot of uh, mess, right? Yeah. If you, if you look at a lot of, a lot of commercial contracts, employment contracts as well, but commercial contracts even more, there is so much of that, which is literally just how to deal with delays 
and on payment, right? If you don't pay me, you will pay extra fees, you know, how to assess payment. Like imagine a commercial contract, which has no payment terms. All right. it says is pay me X amount per second. That's it, right? Either party can close the contract anytime by either stopping the service or stopping the payment. Right. right. It completely removes all that. The kind of messy part of, like you said, collecting payments or payments being late or, you know, needing to collect the payments or needing to renegotiate a payment, you know, the payments already been done and the, the parties are, are kind of always settled. Right. It's, it's always clear that you've paid until this second. And that that kind of clarity can bring a lot of streamline to, to business processes. Yeah, no, I, I, I think there's, that's incredible potential. I, I do think people are conceptually, you're going to have to get through the idea of <laughs> being paid by the second or calculating paying by the second, but obviously that can be shielded with interface. So uh, I think it, I think it makes a, a ton of sense when you, how long have you guys been at Superfluid? I mean, something that where you had something that people could actually develop for it. It's been about a year. I think we, okay. we unveiled about a year ago. Uh, we were on testnet for most of that time and we went live, I think it was March or April, but you know, it's still early days. People are still, even the most basic use cases are still, still need a lot of work. So there's a lot of room for builders to come in and, and build new stuff. We've built a lot of proof of concepts internally that we never released and we're hoping you know, more people will jump in and build those big ideas like trade financing and, you know, uh, credit card kind of experiences, which so far were simply not possible in crypto, but that are now not only possible, but also, you know, I think objectively better than, than the TradFi counterparts. So let's talk a little bit about the trade. Let's talk about those kind of use cases real quickly, the trade financing and kind of credit card functionality yeah. and what you're thinking along those lines. Sure. Well, imagine, for example, you, you know, you're an employee and actually I'm talking to one DAO at the moment that wants to implement this for their employees. Oh, so yeah. imagine you're receiving your, your salary in a stream, right? Uh, your employer has uh, opened the streams, right? What this means is on chain, there is clear information that one address is sending another address a certain amount per second. Now, if you send those funds through an intermediary contract, that intermediary contract is able to potentially stop the flow to the employee if, for example, the employee takes out a loan. What this means is I will lend money to that employee and that employee will stop receiving their salary, which instead will be diverted to repaying the loan until the loan is repaid and then the stream will go back to the employee. Right. And that, it, it could be 100 percent, could be 90 percent, could be 10 percent. You know, that's completely uh, up for definition. But effectively, what this means is if I'm getting paid by a DAO, I now have access to credit. Right. right. Which is like, wait, it's already really cool to work for a DAO. Now it's even better. Right. Right. And uh, these kinds of things are not hard to build uh, using Superfluid. It, it, it really is just another data point you have to account for. And, and then it's done, right? With trade financing, similarly, imagine you have a business that is a SaaS business, right? You're getting paid your subscriptions every second by, by your customers. And again, you, you have an intermediary contract, right? And this contract is able to um, see all the incoming flows and consolidate those and send you the consolidated amount. But you can also say, okay, I will sell the top 10% of my revenue to uh, anyone who will give me, you know, some, some basically an advance, right? And what you do by doing that is basically you, you split off maybe 10% of that stream. You create a new stream to the person lending the money and the business gets an advance. So they get a lump sum, right? right. And what this means is as a, even a small business, as soon as you have some provable income, you could potentially get access to trade financing. Well, if you look at the moment, before you get access to trade financing, you need to be a multi-million dollar company because no financial institution can be bothered to give you trade financing otherwise, right? Right. And that's that's the advantage of having transparent accounting, right? If you have transparent accounting, it's fairly easy to see what's true. You can't cheat, but also if you're a good actor, you get access to you know a wealth of financial opportunities, which are simply impossible in TradFi. Yeah, that's awesome. And I can certainly see all kinds of other models where not only is there they're lending against flows of income, but there are streams that are investment based, right? So someone who is an employee of a DAO or a freelancer for a DAO could automatically set up 
a stream to have 10% of everything going into, you know, stockpiling Ethereum or putting it into a vault or whatever, whatever yeah. they desire. Yeah, that, that's, that's already happening. So recently we announced the MakerDAO, the MakerDAO growth team started using Superfluid to pay their salaries. Nice. And uh, what do you, what do you think they're doing with it? Yeah, of course. <laughs> so, that's they're, brilliant. Receiving, uh, they're receiving DAI every second and they are basically using a protocol called Ricochet. So that's ricochet.exchange. Okay. which basically is a DCA platform. So as they get paid every second, they're investing part of that to buy Ether, Bitcoin, rec more recently Maker, Matic, you know, they're onboarding a lot of different assets. So basically you can invest your salary as you get it completely automatically. And as, you know, as the user of this, you know, obviously the business opens a stream, that's one transaction. You open a stream to Ricochet and that's it. Right? There's two transactions, and the result of these two transactions is a perpetual buying ether, right? Which is something that you know simply you simply couldn't do before. I mean, I guess with Coinbase in some kind of uh, centralized exchange, you maybe could automate stuff like this, but you couldn't do this in in DeFi before. No, and and it's I think that the combination of potential plays and use cases here is a little mind-boggling. Must get a little painful at times to you, you got to stop yourself from going down 400 different tracks of potential use cases and businesses for this thing and focus no, on super fluid instead of going off to run and start another startup uh, absolutely absolutely but it's it's good we have hackathons because they give us you know opportunities to both see what the community comes up with and also sometimes some of us in the team would participate and build and build a proof of concept nice. it's Ultimately, we're, we're builders, you know, we, we, we have fun building stuff and we, we want to explore what's possible. It, anyway, there's a wealth of ideas out there uh, around what you can build with Superfluid. As you mentioned, there's a lot of models. If you're, you know, if anybody in the audience is thinking of anything you could build in DeFi, I think the simplest way is just think of what exists and now think what would that look like with perpetually incoming funds, right? How could you rebuild Uniswap if you had streams? How could you rebuild uh, DYDX if you had streams? How could you rebuild, I don't know, uh, Balancer, right? How could you rebuild Compound, right? All of these can be rebuilt with this real-time component. So you could uh, take out loans in a stream, you could you know, enter leveraged positions in a stream, you could exchange in a stream, and on top of this, you can do all those things we haven't been able to do so far. So right. SaaS models, trade financing, salary payments, recurring payments, you know, debt repayment. So just going back to the credit card example you said before, how this could work is I simply, you know, send a stream of $100 per month to an account of some sort of uh, company. And that company in exchange gives me $100 to spend maybe even on a debit card, right? If you want to connect to the real world, but I can spend those before I pay, right? So I can spend them on the first of the month, even though I'm sending the stream uh, over in a month, right? And nice. what this means is as a user, I have one interaction on chain where I'm committing a hundred dollars, but as a result, I can spend a hundred dollars on the first of the month, right? And this right. is a really good experience. It would allow you to build up a sort of credit score over time. You could increase the limits. You could, you know, do all sorts of things. And again, with very few interactions, but uh, a very smooth way of, of doing the accounting. That's, that's incredible. I've got, I've got 20 ideas going in my head that I want to do right <laughs> now. So, and yeah, I well, think that's, it's, go ahead. I was just going to say, there's a few, there's a lot of uh, people building on Superfluid, right? So Superfluid, we don't build uh, products. Right. Uh, we build the protocol and we have a dashboard so people can get a feel of it. But ultimately we want other people to build stuff on top of right. Superfluid. So there's a few people in our ecosystem that are building things that I think you specifically could use. So nice. I'll, I'll uh, send you some links. Definitely, I'll please do. That'd be great. In terms of, so the project itself, are you a, a company or are you considering yourselves as a, a DAO? How are you struggling? We're currently a company. Okay. Yes. Okay. We're currently a company, but we, we definitely want to be community owned in the future. Okay. And, and you, you had backing from some private investors and some venture capital firms. Is there any thought to those folks potentially pooling funds to invest in startups building on Superfluid? Kind of how are you guys building and growing your ecosystem of developers and partners that are going to build on Superfluid? And are you finding that to be a difficult thing to do because people are so distracted with all the other projects they want to build out in the world that they already thought of? 
or are you actually being able to kind of really get traction because the concepts here are so powerful? Oh, you're essentially growing your ecosystem of developers, what it's yep. like getting them uh, onboarded and, and is it something difficult? And has there been some thought to potentially doing a fund of some kind? I know you're doing hackathons, that kind of thing. So we're very excited about enabling people to work for web free, right? That that's something that's uh, very close to me. You know, as I mentioned, I, I dropped everything when I, when I found out about crypto, but not everybody can drop everything and just jump into, you know, three years of learning before they, they land on a startup, right? So getting people funding is super important. Superfluid does do grants. We've done grants for a few organizations that were building projects we were excited about. We may in the future look at investments as well, but that's not really our job, right? Our job is to, to be the enablers of those people. We have a, a very extensive network of investors and we do leverage that network to help uh, new companies built on superfluid find funding so people building on superfluid can you know rely on us both for advice technical help but also to find funding and structure their startups and their their companies to be successful and what i can tell you is that all our investors are extremely excited about what we're building and as a result of that they're extremely excited about people building on us as well Right. Nice. Because ultimately superfluid isn't uh, going to be successful without successful companies built on superfluid. So we are super excited to, to, you know, grow our community. And if anybody out there, you know, liked this interview, liked what we were talking about and thinks there's a place for them in this, uh, in this ecosystem, just join our discord. And that's kind of the base, the best place to get in contact. And the uh, hackathons are generally a great place to test out ideas in a, you know, very low risk environment. So I would definitely, you know, say, try out your idea at a hackathon. And then if it's, if it's worth what you think it's worth, people will probably notice and you will probably uh, get some funding faster than you, than you think. And for anyone out there listening, that's working in web two, you know, come and work in web three. It's way, way more fun. It's so much more fun. It's so much better. I mean, I could even see somebody forming a, a DAO for investing in projects, utilizing the protocol. What what skill set is 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 this Solidity based? Are people developing utilizing Solidity, or are, or are the APIs available for Solidity to build something? It, I guess it depends on what you want to build. So to to simply build, for example, a, a payment gateway, right, to enable people to accept uh, streaming subscriptions, you really don't need Solidity. You you could right. do it in JavaScript. It's it's very easy. the The protocol doesn't really have any any anything too special or difficult to understand. So you can create a, a payment checkout without needing Solidity. If you want to build anything more complex in the DeFi realm, then definitely Solidity. And our docs are a great place to start. There's definitely some specifics to how Superfluid works. You know the the streams and everything. But it's not that hard. I think everybody can uh, can learn it. And as I said before, I don't think Solidity is is a hard language to learn. What what is hard is is writing very secure smart contracts. But writing a proof of concept is is definitely not hard. And there's a wealth of documentation and examples to to learn from. So I would definitely Art. I would definitely say nobody should be scared about it. Awesome. Awesome. Are you finding most things getting built or being built around uh, stable coins or are you seeing uh, a variety of, of, of payment tokens being utilized potentially in the platform? Good question. We, we thought it would be uh, more stable coins, but actually people are using all sorts of stuff. I guess, for example, with uh, Ricochet, which I mentioned before as a DCA platform, by definition, you need also non, non-stable non assets, right, to invest in. Sure. And people people don't always DCA in, they sometimes DCA out, right? So some people, for example, who are very bad at taking profits might say, might commit to, to selling some ether over time, right? So people are definitely streaming all, all sorts of assets and you can create uh, your own assets using superfluid which are then streamable by default and this means you know ah. creating things like social tokens creating things like oh. uh, you know dao tokens uh, that can be streamed so there's all sorts of different things you could you could create <laughs> sorry i'm just you know that, that that's a whole nother set of um use cases there yeah <laughs> They are, <laughs> as you said before, it's very hard not to fall down a rabbit hole every five minutes. So we got to stay focused, but, but basically 
it's a new primitive for money, right? So yeah. literally everything can can re, can be rebuilt with streams. So who what are the names of your two found your two co-founders? My co-founders are Michele and Miao. Okay. Uh, Miao is our CTO. I've been working with him for a very long time and he used to work at Skype, he used to work at Twidio. He basically has a lot of experience building uh, streaming technology. Funnily enough, he built streaming video and streaming data, huh. and now he's streaming money. And uh, Mikel has uh, got eight years in the startup sector. So he's very much, you know, the structure me and Meow need to, to kind of uh, scale up. And he's, you know, our COO and doing all, all sorts of different things to, to help us scale. So I couldn't be a, in better company. That's great. And in terms of, you know, I, I have to believe that the three of you have had conversations where you really can, can see kind of a big vision of this becoming an incredible, incredibly important tool and standard in the financial market if you're successful. I mean, are those the kinds of things you guys think about? Like, you know, could we be, can you be the, the Legos or the, the building blocks for, you know, financial implications inside and outside of crypto? Is, is that kind of where you're pushing your goals for, or is it just kind of like, okay, let's just get some applications built and we'll see where this whole thing takes us. Well, I mean, we definitely try to keep ourselves grounded because ultimately, you know, you can't, you have to aim for the moon, but you can't, you know, think you're there when you're not right. We, we right. still have so much work to do. It, it's uh, ridiculous. And, you know, it, it takes it takes a while to become, as you said, uh, kind of the backbone for payments online. What okay. I what I feel uh, very unwaveringly about is that streaming is definitely the way we're going to make payments in the future. I don't think we will ever. I, I can't imagine in ten years doing monthly payments. It just doesn't make any sense to me. There's there's right. no service. I'd rather pay every month than every second. And I think, you know, a lot of people who've looked into Superfluid would agree with this. Now, whether that will be on Superfluid or not is is up to us, right? We have to execute on the promise. I do definitely think our technology is extremely powerful and, and I'm super excited to be working on it. But uh, yeah, I generally would stay away from saying we will be this or that because there's still a lot of work to do. That's, that's good. I like that. Do you, are there things in the, in the platform, in what you're building that, well, are there things that keep you up at night because you guys want to build them and you're, you know, you have concerns about being able to kind of get there faster? What, what, where, what's kind of next for you guys in terms of what you're building? Uh, yeah, there's definitely a few things. Some I'll, I'll not talk about today because <laughs> we That's do fine. like to keep, we do like to keep some of the coolness under wraps, but definitely, you know, decentralizing the protocol more. So removing all all points where it relies on you know any any person or entity is super important to us at the same time i'd say building credits like i think i really think superfluid is an amazing tool to build credit markets in defi and i think so many people have tried to build unsecured loans for so long in crypto and ultimately i think they will always fail until you can you know have provable income on chain right but right. by providing that i really think this is the this is the the time we can actually provide the that that unsecured lo loans that uh, we've been talking about for so long so i'm very excited about people working on that problem and i think i think DAOs are going to be a much better place to work than traditional uh, web2 companies very soon because DAOs will be the first to adopt streaming payments they'll be the first to adopt streaming salaries and they'll probably be the first to adopt all sorts of other advantages that streaming salaries come with like i said before things like loans for employees based on on cash flows are something that i've already i'm already speaking with some DAOs about right and we haven't even built it and they're already excited about using it and that's something that's uh not keeping me up at night but it will keep me up until late at night working that's good that's good in terms of the 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 standards that you guys have developed is this something that you envision kind of releasing as a standard into the market that that can be built upon or mm -hmm. is that something further down the line to be considered well everything we built is open source so you know anybody right. can can check it out use it uh fork it if they want uh, you know it, it would be uh, rather flattering if somebody forked it so far it hasn't happened because i think a lot of people <laughs> don't fully understand how it works i think standards are 
are misunderstood very often. And I don't think what we built needs to be a standard in itself. The same yeah. way, you know, Uniswap isn't the standard, right? Uh, it's just a, a protocol. A standard is a way of more applications using the same standard, right? So until there's a second version of Superfluid, I don't think we need to be a standard, but there's definitely a lot of standardization around Superfluid concepts that could be helpful. And we, we have a few team members who are very oriented towards that. One of our uh, most recent hires wrote an IP about streaming payments, which was not related to Superfluid. That was a kind of older than, than us. And he since huh. rediscovered the idea and decided to work with us, right? And wow. uh, that's that's exciting. You know, he recognized that his original design had some limitations that we overcome in different ways, right? And ultimately, it's a powerful idea. So people like like the vision of the future we're working for. And I was very excited that he decided to join us. It was, it was very very uh, one of the, my my uh, top moments this year. Basically, that's awesome. How many how many people on your team right? There's currently ten of us. But oh, nice. we, we have a lot of open open positions. So if anybody's interested, head over to jobs.superfluid.finance. And it's definitely a great place to work. We definitely have a lot of work to do. So if you're scared by too much work, don't join. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. Um, I ask, look, I could go, I could literally go through a hundred use cases with you on this, but we'd be here all day. So first, thank you so much for walking us through this. And I, I, I like I said, I'm, my head is spinning right now. I ask everybody that appears on the show, are there, would you name a pro project or people in this world, in our ecosystem, in the DeFi space, whatever that you think are um, incredibly important, whether they be famous or or not as well known, and for which you you know you have a lot of respect, or you look up to, or you think they're leading a path that we should all be uh, taking a look at. People or projects, right? Yeah, you said. Yeah, I'd say in general, I have a ton of respect for people advancing scaling. Scaling is, I mean, and I say this as a kind of very broad category, obviously, there's a lot of people working on it, but scaling is an incredibly long-term and unrewarding thing to work on because right. people, like everybody takes for granted everything, right? Everybody takes for granted Ethereum itself. It's very hard to build a business around. It's very hard to monetize and it's very hard to to even achieve right so right. i have a lot of respect for people taking on the very hard problems and i think it's it's amazing what's happening both on the you know optimistic rollups but also if you look at the, the zk rollups they're just mind-boggling mind-boggling right like the the amount of work that people have put into advancing a branch of cryptography that wasn't really used before Right. right, like it's it's just fascinating. And while I don't uh, pretend to understand it, I, I think it's some of the most fascinating thing stuff in crypto. And apart from that, I'd say all the people who are working on explaining this uh, to regulators, uh, I think regulation is probably the probably the biggest challenge to crypto right now. From a technical point of view, I'm very optimistic that we'll beat all the, you know, we'll beat all the, all the monsters on the road, you know, we'll, we'll achieve uh, better scalability, we'll achieve uh, better usability, we'll achieve even mass adoption, right? I'm very bullish on all of those. What I'm not so bullish on is the incompetence of bureaucrats. Yes. And unfortunately, you know, the, the people who are, seem to be less inclined to adopt technology are also the ones regulating it. And that's uh, very frightening. Yep. So I think, I think it's, it's very commendable that people like, for example, Ryan Salkis, you know, who's very outspoken about this are taking it onto themselves to, to do the work. Right. Yep. And you know, that's, it's, uh, you know, we're in Europe, but we definitely look at the US, but at the same time, you know, Europe isn't that much better, right? So right, right. really ed educating regulators is just as unrewarding as scaling, but ultimately is of vital importance. So I really respect people who work on that. Yeah, I do too. I, I'm sitting here wearing my fourth coin center uh, t-shirt because I <laughs> nice. love the work those guys are doing. And I think it's critical. I do think explaining is critical. We actually have been having a lot of conversations here in the US with people about also utilizing the power of this community, the wealth that's been built and the, the numbers of people involved because it's also a political battle. And here in the US, Ryan and others are uh, really leading the way 
on taking on the political battle side of it, right? Because in the US, if you if you can scare the politicians enough, you'll get what you want and or, you know, carrot and stick kind of thing works very effectively here. I actually started my career off in in politics and so it's something I think we have to be doing here. But what I'm curious what is what I was curious about is, you know, do you guys uh, look, Europe is at least better and other parts of the parts of Europe are even better than other parts of Europe and other parts of the world like Singapore and others get it even more. Do you guys kind of look <laughs> look back at the US and say, oh my God, please don't screw all this up for all of us? Or because of how the US kind of beats people over the head with financial economic policy? Or is it just kind of like, well, the US will screw this up and we'll still plug away here in, in Europe? I think crypto is really not geographic. Like that's right. that's one of the reasons why we keep having these problems, right? That crypto is crypto is beyond geographies. Yep. But regulation isn't. And the fact that crypto is beyond geographies means that there's absolutely no way it's gonna disappear. Right. I, I don't think regulators can possibly do anything about that. And interestingly, I saw this hearing in the Nigerian parliament where the Nigerian parliament says, we cannot do anything about this. Huh, this right. is happening, right? And it's it's uh, revealing to me that they would understand that while the US thinks they can't do anything about it, yeah. right? And, and that's simply, I think, a bit of a power trip that the US is on. Yep. The truth is you crypto can't be regulated like old tech it, it's just fundamentally different and because of that i think they will try a lot and they will fail a lot and and that will effectively make everything slower that's what uh, i'm worried about i do think you know the us and europe are generally uh very bureaucratic and dominated by probably yeah i'd say too much regulation generally like regulators who think that they know what they're doing right um, yep. and think they can solve problems by making uh, very detailed rules which is actually you know hindering innovation generally so yeah i'm trying to leave my politics out of this but it's quite hard i would generally say europe and the us are more likely to slow down innovation because they think they can I think yep. the rest of the world is less likely to try and hinder innovation and more likely to embrace it because they understand that they can't hinder, they can't really stop it. So you might as well embrace it, right? Like you said, Singapore, for example, is a great example. But also now we're seeing, you know, smaller nations in South America, which we've always derided for being backward, actually, you know, understanding that they can actually leapfrog a traditional finance, which the US and uh, European policies have kept them out of yep. by, you know, simply ignoring what the naysayers are, are doing in the government here and just jumping forward with where the tech is at, right? So I, I think it's definitely going to shift things, right? If you if you think that the, the first country to adopt, to adopt uh, Bitcoin as legal tender is a South American country, it kind of tells you that it really isn't geographic and it could happen anywhere. So yeah, I, I, I'm generally very excited about uh, where we're going, but uh, I do think regulators are a bit probably think they can do more than they can. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think what, look, I think what the impact will be is they're going to go after the people who are not anonymous in order to try to scare those, the rest of the ecosystem. Um, and at the end of the day, all it'll do is make everything become anonymous, right? And you're right. I don't. I actually don't know that they can stop it. Nor I don't. I'm not even sure they can slow it down as much, if that happens. But obviously, we would much prefer to have countries embrace it and regulators embrace it for what it is, which is something that can advance financial freedom significantly. So that's great. How should people get in touch? A Twitter website, you know, so they can find your Discord link, all that good stuff. What's the best way for people to reach out? Yeah. So. I guess definitely is Twitter. Twitter is where you, you get all your superfluid news. So uh, superfluid underscore HQ. Okay. Our Discord is discord.superfluid.finance. And for all the builders in the house, go to our docs, which is docs.superfluid.finance. And there you can get started and send your first flow from a command line in about, I think, three lines of code. So pretty easy. Nice. 
And for anyone who wants to try Superfluid, uh, you can go to app.superfluid.finance and you can use it through testnet if you don't have any funds and you know quickly get a feel of what uh, money streaming is. And yeah, you can find me on, on Twitter as well. I'm at Francesco Renzi A. And I'm generally not tweeting as much as I should, but looking around. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much for your time. I'm, I, I get excited about a lot of projects in DeFi, but I'm really excited about the potential of what you guys are building. And I definitely want to circle back with you as you launch new things and do new things and new partners are launching new projects. If you have any projects that are utilizing Superfluid that you think I should talk to, I'd be happy to, to meet them I, I, and have them on the show. And I, I can assure you that coming out of this, I'm going to have, my partners are going to be annoyed because I'm going to have 20 ideas that we need to develop right away. So I, I'm very excited about what you're building, friend, and I wish you all much success. <laughs> Thanks, man. 